A degree in law by the Complutense University of Madrid, degrees in French, Italian, and English from the same university, PhD in French literature, master's degree in translation, a diploma in comparative law by the University of Trieste in Italy, another diploma in management from the University of Paris and Cranfield in the United Kingdom, a lawyer by the Bar of Madrid, General Secretary of a Techni Technical College in Madrid, Head of the Department of Labor Relations in the Spanish Ministry of Employment, Legal Linguist in the European Court of uh, Justice. And uh, she wasn't busy enough, and then he became the uh, head of the Spanish Department in Translation Services of the European, European Commission. This is our keynote speaker of today, Dr. Elena uh, Fernandez Miranda. Welcome. Well, I am delighted to have this opportunity of being with you, but I am also very envious of you because you are living in this beautiful town that my uh, late husband, Eugene Naida, visited in many occasions. I was very surprised because I had been recently in Salt Lake City. I was trying to find information about him, and it was constantly Brownsville, Brownsville. I was thinking, well, so fantastic, so imagine the privilege that represented for, for me to be here today. Well, I want to present to you uh, this book. It's uh, Sobre la Traducción that my husband and myself, we have selected, updated, and translated from two of his main books, Toward Science of Translating and the Theory of Practice of Translation. They are really too classic than I use in many universities. The first part of the book that corresponds to Tower of Science or, Transla or Translating uh, describes the na nature of the meaning, the role of the, translate, the, the translator, the three essential meanings, linguistic, referential, and cognotative, and of course, his essential uh, theory uh, the dynamic equivalence in translation. The second part uh, that corresponds to uh, the theory and practice of translation uh, describes the real processes that are used uh, in translating. So, analysis of these three meanings I have mentioned, uh, transfer, uh, restructuring, and testing the translation. But before presenting his ideas, um, I think it's essential to know how NIDA conceive and develop them. They are the result of a very, very intense uh, field work that he realized for more than 50 years, traveling constantly around the world and studying more than 200 languages and cultures. After his passing, I have discovered in his archives a fascinating manuscript than he uh, called my world. He said literally, traveling around the world several times in order to help translators, I had met a number of cultures. It was crucial for me to know the values of these different peoples in order to understand how they communicate meaningfully with one another. So he participated in their weddings, funeral, banquets, he met their quack doctors, he made a lot of friends, and doing so, he studied many, many languages and cultures. He started his field, uh, field work when he was only 21 years old. He looked like a child. And, uh, but nevertheless, he was graduated at the uh, UCLA, uh, UCLA in Asian Greek and Anthropology. In the same manuscript, he said about this first experience. My first trip in northern Mexico was two days by horseback from the end of the railroad where I was scheduled to do carpentry work on a school closet and on the side to learn the Taromara culture and language. 
Actually, it was the main purpose, of course. It was terribly cold there. Uh, there was no food available. He lost uh, some of his uh, teeth. He was very, very, very ill. But uh, he fulfilled his purpose, and he learned that culture and the language. It would be only the beginning of a very, very long uh, field work that lasted practically all his life. One of the result, one of that experience is the book I am presenting today. Translating is essentially a process of communication. And this means that a translator must go beyond the lexical structures to consider the manner in which an intended audience is likely to understand a test. In testing the adequacy of a translation, the essential question are for whom, in what cultural setting. In fact, the role of the audience is essential in translation. To start with, a translator must establish certain priorities. One, contextual consistency should have priority over purely verbal consistency. Dynamic equivalence has priority over formal correspondence. Expressions that are used by and are acceptable to the intended audience have priority over expressions that may be traditionally more prestigious. What does it mean? Why he mentioned this, that we had to use the, the, the common expression instead of other more prestigious? Well, uh, it's, it's very, very important to see his background. In the 40s, the American Bible Society noticed that many local people around the world, in Africa, Asia, South America, they couldn't understand the Bible who had been which had been translated in their languages. How is possible? You have the Bible in your language and you can't understand it? Well, they decided to hire a very, very eminent linguist, Eugene Nida. He had um, a PhD by the University of uh, Michigan with a brilliant dissertation, a hypnosis on, uh, in English syntax. Then, uh, as I have said, he, had, um, uh, he, he was graduating at UCLA in uh, Asian Greek, uh, anthropology. He had studied at university three years on New Testament. He was the ideal person for doing this job. So they appointed him as a translation consultant. Immediately, he started going around the world to find out where was the problem. Well, very simple, he discovered immediately is because missionaries from English, German, Spanish, whatever, had been translating the Bible word by word and translating the expressions in the Bible in the local languages that, of course, it was impossible to understand for them. So, well, I know very well this problem because I was in, in, in Brussels in a Bible study and uh, they were using a very old artificial version of the Bible. And I told them, please, don't, don't use this, this, this Bible. It's impossible to understand. What we don't use today news is a version that NIDA had been uh, organizing, revising since 78 until 2002. And they said, ah, no, it's because God spoke like this. Ah, sorry, sorry. If God spoke like this, I said nothing. Amen. So this is the mentality, you know? Some people imagine that these expressions are absolutely from God or who knows. So neither said, no, we have to, people have to understand what the Bible said. So immediately he trained, in, uh, encouraged native translators. There are many, many people in Africa and Asia who know very well, for example, English or French, and then they are local languages. So he started training them, encouraging them in such a way that they translated the Bible using their expressions, not these prestigious uh, expressions that were in English or uh, German or whatever. Their expression, their idioms, their, the use of their language, metaphors, etc. In such a way that the source message arrived with all its emotional subtleties 
to the heart of the final receptor. What, what was important for NIDA was how different cultures used words and the values attached to these words. In fact, for example, well, I remember a fantastic lecture he gave in Madrid at the Complutense University, how to help people to translate culture. He explained how our common expressions we have for, we can say, for example, oh, I have a broken heart, or oh, my heart is, well, there are other cultures, for example, in Africa, than, uh, in which the, the, the heart is not the most precious organ. For example, is liver, because they have this problem with malaria, whatever. And they express emotions, they express with metaphors about the liver. In his book, in the, or his memory, Fascinated by Languages, he says, the general lack of stylistic sensitivity to the literary forms of a lack of local language has repeatedly impressed me. Because he wanted everybody, when they translate, to express in their language the, the normal uh, expressions of their cultures. After his uh, passing, I received a um, very, very moving letter from a lady, one of these native translators in Africa, in Ivory Coast, a lady the name Linel Zogbo. I read for you the letter. I remember discussing uh, with uh, Jean Naida how important it is, how feasible, to present and discuss difficult subjects in easy to understand terms for the receptors of a message. I never have forgotten his words, and I have strived my whole career to follow his advice. He has impacted who I am and who I view my work in a very significant way. Easy to understand terms for the receptor. This is very, very important. No strange, uh, strange expressions than we translate word by word. Well, we said one of the priorities, another of the priorities is contextual consistency should have priority over purely verbal consistency. What does it mean that? Context is a lot more important is than isolated words. Words only have meaning in our mind and have the emotive meaning that our culture gives to them. There is a meaningful meaning, meaningful relationship between culture and words. Culture, most words, and the words with the emotive meaning that we give to them mold the culture. We have to concentrate in, in the phrase, not in the word. The phrase communicates the concept, not the word that in itself doesn't mean anything. But even some phrases are ambiguous until the moment in which we insert them in a broader context. In, uh, because sometimes we can find the clue of the meaning simply in a sentence, but in a whole discourse, in the whole topic, and in the use that, it, it, that, that we have in our culture, the use we give to us. He insisted, neither insisted very, very much, how important is the, w the, the use? Well, one time uh, we were in uh, the first, when I met him, we were uh, in the Complutense University in Madrid, and then uh, he gave an incredible lecture, absolutely fantastic. So at the end, everybody, professor, students alike, everybody stood up yelling, yelling. I, well, really, I can't forget that this, this moment because everybody was yelling. Que tío, que tío. I don't know if you understand the meaning. It means what an incredible man. And then I could see that he was mm, uh, uncomfortable. He didn't know if they were praising him or they attacking him. And then he asked me, why they call me uncle? <laughs> this is the question they use. In Spanish, we use very much, que tío. So I, we don't know how to translate this expression if I don't know. Another time, uh, well, I like very much to talk about his profile, how he was. Uh, he, uh, as I have told you, he had been traveling around the world, uh, particularly dealing with very, very poor people, 
all over the world in Africa. And he, he felt a tremendous pity for them. So all his money went immediately to help poor people. So you can even his fabulous house in Connecticut, in Greenwich, Connecticut, and it was incredible. I have, he never told me that. I discovered after his passing, he has given to students of the third world. But anyway, uh, he, he hated to buy clothes for him. Everything has to be for the poor people. And uh, if I insisted, we have a conflict. He didn't work. But one day I said, no, enough is enough. I am terribly sorry. You are wearing, well, he was wearing a tie and he had paid one dollar for it. So you can imagine the beautiful tie. So I, uh, I told him, well, I, I am sorry, I'm giving to you a beautiful coat because he was wearing a raincoat and he was freezing in this <laughs> poor raincoat. So I bought for him a beautiful cashmere, navy blue uh, coat. He was so proud. So it was Christmas, so we went to the house of my mother. And my mother opened the, the door and she said, Menudo abrigo. I don't know if you understand the expression. Lit it means what a fantastic uh, coat. Literally, menudo means small or little. Again, he was very uncomfortable. He told me, oh, the coat is too small for me, no? I said, no, a bit. It's fantastic because I couldn't understand why he asked me. No, no, it's because your mother said that this menudo. How we use this is what is important for translating and for understanding the meaning the use in every culture and it's completely different in the different cultures well in this volume uh, language is considered as a part of the whole human behavior we can't be happy considering a language as a fixed corpus or sentence of words but a, a dynamic mechanism which can generate infinite series of different expressions. In translating, we receive a unique message in the source language, and we create a message equally unique in the receptor language. It is the reason why translating is one of the most difficult and complete intellectual activities that can undertake the human brain. But we know the judgment of the early Renaissance Italian writers who contended that translations are like women, ugly when they are faithful, and unfaithful when they are lovely. <laughs> and even in the 18th century, Sir John Denham describes the average translator in such a lines as, such is our pride, our folly, or our fate. Than few, but such a kind of right, translate. But this is not true at all, because we know that they are fantastic translations, for example, uh, I remember Baudelaire translating uh, Edgar Allan Poe is fantastic, or um, Borges, or recently I have read uh, a translation of uh, Dostoyevsky made by Lain and Tralgo, absolutely fantastic. So translation can be something very alive and very good. I have said that in the first part of the book is uh, uh, deals with the nature of the meaning. In the study of meaning, attention has shifted from concern with the reference to the use, the use of the word. This is very important, within the total behavior. This type of functional definition of meaning suggests the very process by which terms acquire meaning, namely through contextual conditioning. Well, uh, Naida said that there is a tribe in Colombia and they are called motilones. These people, when the first Spanish arrived, they were, now uh, we don't say so much, but in the past constantly, the Spanish people were saying, Ave Maria Purissima, Ave Maria Purissima. So Motilones, when these Spanish arrived, they couldn't understand the meaning of what is this Ave Maria Purissima. But it seemed to them that they were using this expression in the same context that they invoke demoniac powers. So even today, they call the devil Maria Purissima. <laughs> the role of the translator, what is our role as translators? The translator has to transfer the content of the message uh, in the source language 
in the, uh, from the, so the, the source language in the most clear and acceptable manner possible, of course. In principle, the translator has to decode the message, transfer it in his brain from the source language to the receptor language, encode in the receptor language. He cannot simply match word from the dictionary, for neither translating must be concerned. He used to, to repeat this very much with meaningful mouthfuls, so reasonable whole images, and with translating entire concepts no merely seri series of words or isolated fragments. The translator must understand not only the obvious content of the message, but also the subtleties of meaning, the significant emotive values of words, and the stylistic feature which determine the flavor and feel. I was in Brussels and uh, listening a lecture from a Danish translator, and he was uh, talking to a uh, translator in European Union, and he said, remember, you have to translate Andersen. He was Danish, and he was explaining how to translate Andersen. You have to translate Andersen in the way that neither explains. So carrying over the subtleties and emotion of the source message in such a way that it arrives to the heart of the final receptor, which I have said, uh, before. When we, read, uh, when we read a translation, we have to feel the same emotions that felt the original readers. Otherwise, we are no good translators. The translator should also have an effective empathy with the original author. To summarize, the ideal role of the translator calls for a person who has complete knowledge of both source and receptor languages, intimate acquaintance with the subject matter, effective empathy with the author and the content, and a stylistic facility in the receptor language. Well, now we arrive to his essential theory, the dynamic equivalence in translating. So uh, first, uh, I will talk about what is formal equivalence and dynamic equivalence. What is formal equivalence? The formal equivalence focuses attention on the message itself in both form and content. In such a translation, one is concerned with such correspondences as sentence to sentence, concept to concept, view from this formal orientation, the message in the receptor language should match as closely as possible the different elements in the source language. This means, for example, that the message in the receptor culture is constantly compared with the message in the source culture to determine standards of accuracy and correctness. So translation, informal equivalence, tries to reproduce all the grammatical units, consistency in word usage, meanings in terms of the source content. The reproduction of grammatical units may consist translating nouns by nouns, verse by verse, keeping all phrases and sentences intact, and preserving all formal indicators. For example, marks of punctuation, paragraph breaks, etc. So, a translation in formal uh, equivalence preserve syntax, uh, class of words, lexicon, but it's evident that the content will be lost or distorted. For this reason, Naida elaborated his theory of the dynamic equivalence. What does he mean, the dynamic equivalence? In contrast, a translation we attempt to produce a dynamic rather than a formal equivalence is based upon the principle of equivalent effect. In such a uh, translation, one is not concerned with matching the receptor language message with the source language message, but with a dynamic relationship that exists between them. The translator seeks to produce on his reader an impression similar to that produced by the original. The translation should make the same resultant impression on the reader as the original does in his reader. A translation of dynamic equivalence aims a complete naturalness of expression and tries to relate the receptor to modes of behavior relevant within the context of his own culture. The real 
the best translation is the one that makes the reader forget completely than is a translation. I am reading a book, I forget it's a translation. They're speaking as I speak, with my expressions, with my idioms, with my use of words. The text of a real translation is that it should not read a, like a translation at all. That is just the way we would say it. Characters and situation had to arrive to us, and they were in the mind and the heart of the author, not in his pen. One way of defi defining a translation in dynamic equivalence is to describe it as the closest natural equivalent to the source language message. This type of definition contains three essential terms. One, equivalent, we point toward the source language message. Natural, we point toward the receptor language. And closest, which binds the two orientations together on the basis of the highest degree of approximation. But if we define more fully the implication of the word natural, we can say that this word is applicable to three areas of the communication process. For a natural rendering must fit the receptor language and culture as a whole, the context of the particular message and the receptor language audience. So the translation in dynamic equivalence should be a reproduction of the original text that the author would have made if he had known the receptor language. New attitude with respect to receptor languages. Each language has its own genius. This is absolutely in indispensable to, to understand. In the first place, it is essential to recognize that each language has its own genius. That is to say, each language possesses certain distinctive characteristics which give it a special character. For example, word building capacities, unique patterns for phrase order, markers of discourse, special discourse types and techniques for linking closing to sentences, etc. And to communicate effectively, one must respect the genius of each language. Rather than force the formal structure of one language upon another, the effective translator is quite prepared to make any and all formal changes necessary to reproduce the message in the distinctive structural form of the receptor languages. If all languages differ in form, and this is the essence of their being different languages, then quite naturally, the form must be changed if one is to preserve the content. When Naida was explaining this to the native translators in Cameroon, one of, the, of them said, ah, I can see very well. It's what the python snake does. He uh, hunts an animal, but the animal is, the form of the animal is, is uh, well, uh, so different to his uh, digestive system than he can swallow. So what the python does, dislocate all the bones, roll the animal, and when he's ready for swallow, in this moment, okay, he swallowed it. It's what we have to do when the form of the, of the original or the source message is too difficult for our readers to swallow, to understand well, we have to change radically the form for our readers to swallow this perfectly well. So in order to maintain the content of the message, it is necessary to change the form. The measure in which we have to change the form will depend of the linguistic and cultural distance between the languages. It's evident, for example, if I translate from French, from Portuguese, from Italian, I don't need it to change very, very much the form. If I translate from English into Spanish, I need to change a lot, a lot of things, the passive, the order, the words, etc., etc. Processes used on translating. Well, we have said that in the book deals with the different meanings, linguistic, referential, a cognotative. What is this? The, the linguistic analysis. It is evident that grammar has a meaning, the one which derives from the construction itself. Linguistic meaning must be carefully distinguished from other types of meaning for the linguistic signification of a form 
does not refer to anything outside or language itself, as the referential or emotive meaning. But sometimes we find out that the same grammatical construction can have completely different meanings. The so-called possessive constructions provides a striking contrast in the relation between the elements of the construction. Compare, for example, the following expressions. His sin, his house, his destruction, his way, his arm, his failure, failure, his arrest. Most of them are not possessive, as you can see. So how to know, for example, in this kind of constructions, the real meaning of the sentence? Well, Naida says that to understand properly the meaning of expressions apparently similar, but with a completely different meaning, because, of course, for the translator, the first thing, the essential thing, is to understand the meaning of the original. It's evident. If we don't understand the source language, it's impossible. So he said that the best is to go to the kernel sentences by means of back transformation. What is this, the kernel sentences? So he says, for example, in the, in the sentence, his sins, to go to the kernel sentence is to go to A does B. He sins. His destruction. X does B to X. X destroys him. His way. He goes on the way. A goes on B. His arm. He has an arm. B is a part of A. A kernel sentence is a simple declarative sentence containing no modifiers, no connectives that may be used in making more elaborate sentences. It is the simple possible sentence. Evidently, they are not identical in all languages, but from the standpoint of the translator, what is even more important than the existence of kernels in all languages is the fact that languages agree far more on the level of the kernels than on the level of the more elaborate structures. In all languages, there are half a dozen to a dozen of these very basic structures. The actual kernel expression in English from which the more elaborate grammatical structures can be constructed, constructed consists on the following illustrative types. John ran quickly, John hit Bill, John gave a ball, John is in the house, John is sick, etc. For the translator to go down to these basic structures is very useful. He doesn't need to translate them literally at all, the opposite. He, he should not translate them literally, but they represent the base for understanding the meaning for the transfer, because they are the clearest and least ambiguous statement of the relationship between words. Naida proposed that this is a, a lot better to, uh, to, uh, to use semantic categories instead than the normal grammatical classes. For example, the grammatical classes are noun, verb, adjective, preposition, Instead, the semantic categories are a lot more important for understanding the meaning because what is important is not if a word is a noun or a verb, but the semantic relation than this word with other words. What is this of semantic uh, categories? He mentioned object of entity refers to those semantic classes we desi designate things or entities which normally participate in events, house, dog, man, son, etc. Event is the semantic class we designate action, processes, happenings, run, jump, kill, etc. Characteristics refer to the semantic class of expression which have as their own reference qualities, quantities, degrees, object, event. For example, red is only a quality inherent in certain object, red hat, red mm, face, etc. And links or relation are the expression of the meaningful connection between the other kinds of terms. Well, we said, what is this? If, uh, entity object, this is nouns because refer to those semantic class, designate things or entities. Or event, designate action processes, verbs. Characteristic qualities, quantities is uh, adjective or, or adverb, no. No, it's, 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 they, there is a corresponding, but not always existed the corresponding. For example, there are nouns like redemption, arrest, error, that 
are essentially events world, and we have to understand as uh, uh, action processes, etc. Not like, like like nouns. These nouns that indicate events more than object reflect the kernel sentence in which the correspond event is expressed by a verb. For example, uh, he was redeemed, he was arrested, here, and there are other nouns as goodness, kindness, beauty, come from kernel sentences in which the abstract are expressed by adjectives. Well, by back transformation, we arrive to the kernels to know very well what a, a, a word means. Then uh, we have to, 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 to have the same mechanism applied in opposite direction in order to form the most elaborate construction. We call this second process transformation. For example, we have a kernel. She sings beautiful, beautifully, but we can elaborate a lot of expressions from this kernel. The beauty of her singing, her singing is beautiful, her beautiful singing, etc. The recognition of the fact that in English, as well in all languages, the same kernel can give rise to a number of different surface structure expression with different features of focus is essential if we have to handle source materials properly in a receptor language. Well, we have said one meaning is linguistic or grammatical. Another one is referential. What is the referential? The specific meaning of a word which is intended is marked by the interaction of that term with the meanings of the other terms in its environment. We have said menudo abrigo, for example. Of course, menudo itself means one thing, but if we put in contact with other, change completely the meaning. We can illustrate it by the use of the verb run in a se series of sentences. Well, the verb uh, to run, uh, we know the meaning. In some dictionaries, they say there are 90 meanings for the verb uh, uh, to run. It's not true. There is only one. It's moving the legs rapidly in order to speed up. So w as when we say the horse runs, the man runs, the dog runs, but there are many other meanings that result from the interaction of the verb to run with other terms. The motor runs, the business runs, the water runs, the tap runs, his nose runs, the nose uh, doesn't run at all, it's evident, something else. So there are conventions in English, but there are in other languages other conventions. They are not natural meanings, they are conventions. Because for example, in French, the tap runs, we say uh, le, le, le robinet cool, or, for example, in Spanish, the business runs, we say, el negocio funciona, etc. Well, connotative meaning. Now we have linguistic or grammatical, we have referential, and now con what is connotative meaning? Connotative meaning is the aspect of the meaning which deals with our re emotional reaction to words. Because we react emotionally to words. Sometimes we react uh, very uh, strongly, uh, other times affirmatively, other times negatively, other times weakly. The association surrounding words can be so, so powerful, so strong, that we avoid to pronounce these words, particularly in a polite society. They are words, absolute verbal taboo. Normally, they are words associated with the body function, the body organs, but mind you, that the taboo is against the word, not against the referent. Because when we see the same things expressed in scientific terms, it's perfectly, perfectly good. It's not taboo at all. Well, there are different taboos. For example, in the, the, the old Hebrews, they had a taboo to pronounce because inspired fear, the name of Yahweh. They avoid to pronounce this, this Yahweh. Then you know very well that we have a lot of uh, substitute euphemism for the word toilet. In America, you say uh, restrooms, in England, loo, in Spanish, baño, etc. But what is important in this connotative meaning dealing with emotions is what I have said 
when I explain the role of translator. So to carry over the emotions and the subtleties of words in the, uh, uh, that in the source language provoke an emotion in the readers. For example, we have a fantastic book uh, of mice and men from Steinbeck. When we read this book, we feel a tremendous emotion because these two poor men, they are simple, they are poor, they are ignorant, and they have a language typical of this kind of people. If we translate this in a formal language, it's evident that we lose completely of the, the, the emotions. So this is very, very important to arrive to the heart of our readers when we translate. Transfer. We have analyzed the three meanings, linguistic, referential, and uh, connotative. After the three analyses, we have to transfer the result of the analysis from the source language to the receptor language. This transfer takes place in the translator brain, of course. We must preserve, by all means, the contents. There are several problems in, tra in transferring the, a message from the source language to the, the receptor language. Idioms, for example, idioms. We have an idiom when, uh, in the source language we are translating. We find an idiom. How to translate this? Sometimes we can find another idiom in other uh, language. Sometimes it's impossible. So this is one of the problems. Another problem, formulas. You can see in all languages have the elaborated formulas. Imagine in French. In French, every time that they are writing a letter at the end, they said, Je vous prie, monsieur, de bien vouloir agréer l'expression de mes sentiments les meilleurs. So it can be 14 words. Instead, in English, you say, Your sincerely. It's all. So when I had to translate these tremendous formulas, I translate. We use, this is the point, how we use to say goodbye in a letter. In Spanish, it will be even more simple. Atentamente. O atentamente le saluda. So, the 14 letters, two letters. Then, uh, adjustment in the sentence structure, of course. We had to change word and phrase order when it is necessary. Active and passive constructions. In, in English, you know very well that passive, passive, passive is, is constant. Instead, in Spanish, it would be oh, shocking, shocking. We can't, uh, we can't preserve uh, this passive. Well, we have to transfer at all cost the content of the message, the emotional flavor and impact of the message. This is essential. Imagine, for example, you have El Cantar del Mio Cid in Spanish. There is a moment in which Mio Cid say goodbye because he has to go to, uh, to abandon his, uh, his, his place uh, to his wife and to his daughters. The emotion is so tremendous that we want to cry. Imagine if I translated this, uh, adios, me voy. No, we have to reproduce exactly the same emotion. Otherwise you lose the, mes the content of the message. And then, if it's possible to transfer some of the form, of course, we have to do it. When it's possible, absolutely. Well, we have the transfer, we have now restructuring. In restructuring a message, after having transferred it from the source language to the receptor language, it is essential that one consider the sociological levels of language. Of course, it's not the same to translate for children, for example. So we have to consider age, sex, educational level, occupation, social class, etc. And the situational levels of language. If we have to use, imagine, for example, I am translating a, a letter full of love. We can translate with technical words or, or with formal in a, in a formal way, no. We have to distinguish technical, formal, informal, casual, intimate, etc. Testing the translation. How we can test the translation? It's very simple. It consists in, determine, in, in determining how the potential 
receptors of a translation to react to it. In the first example that we have said, when these missionaries were translating the Bible, uh, using uh, translating word by word, using the same expression of the original, the reaction of the potential translator, we can figure out perfectly well. Impossible to understand one word. Instead, when the native translators are translating the Bible using their idioms, their expression, their metaphors, ah, everybody understands this. So it's very, very important to figure out how our readers will understand our translator. The ultimate basis for judging a translation. What is a good translation? Evidently, after uh, so many things we have said, it's quite evident. A we start by bad translation. A bad translation is a translation that preserves all the lexicon, uh, class of words, syntax, but the content of the message is lost or distorted. There is another, another bad translation than this by paraphrase, by deletion, addition, on squeeing the message. For example, I have at home, comes from my father, a beautiful book, one of the most beautiful I have at home, leather, navy blue, fantastic. And this indicated translation of Paradise Lost from John Milton. Oh, one of my passions is to contrast the originals and the uh, translation. So I took Paradise Lost, and I was so happy in front of me I am contrasting this. I read the first page, nothing. The second page, nothing similar. All the book has absolutely nothing to, <laughs> to do with the original. It was, uh, <laughs> it was translated by a priest of a church in Madrid, El Perpetuo Socorro, Then he put a lot of angels, a lot of demons, but it's nothing to do with the original. This is a very bad, very, very bad uh, translation, of course. What is the good translation? What I have said in dynamic equivalence. So we restructure the form, the class of words, the lexicon, the syntax, but we preserve the contents. And our readers can so swallow as the Python did. Conclusion, the best translation is the one that doesn't seem a translation. It should be a reproduction of the original text as the author could have made if he had known the receptor language. It is what I hope I have done with this. And now it is an honor to offer to Dr. Davila. Okay. Well, you know that you can ask your question in Spanish or English. Uh, yes, I will do it uh, by using the microphone. Yeah. Um, we saw in our picture how the notion of a translator, Saint Jerome, in our example, has been evolving. Uh, in a sense, uh, translation research in the last, let's say, 30 years has also been evolving from uh, looking at translation uh, in a normative way, just to say how things should be done. And then research and the focus of, of, of uh, many scholars uh, have increasingly shifted towards looking at how translations are done beyond how they should be done. Um, and there will be more a descriptive approach of what really happens and you brought to us many, many good examples of how things end up happening uh, with all their shortcomings many times. And then we are uh, now moving towards asking why translations are done the way are done. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, question would be uh, given your uh, profound reading 
of, 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 of what Eugene Nida wrote, said, and thought. Uh, what do you think he would say about why uh, formal equivalence still is, very often, what's out there? Well, I am sorry to say that it's a question that uh, sometimes the translator can't get properly the meaning of the original. And the easiest way is to translate keeping the form. So it's very easy. You take a, a text uh, in English or uh, whatever, and then you don't understand, you don't get well the meaning, and then you translate. You have a tendency to keep the form translating word by word. The very good translator is the one who knows the, the source messages, the source language, perfectly well. All the uses, all the, the subtleties. And then he can elaborate in his brain the equivalent. Well, uh, about this in the European Union, where I had been uh, working for many, many years, we have uh, written a book, very, very interesting, in which we put the original, how it was translated, and how it had to be translated. So it was really a tremendous hit, and they were about to kill me, but I did. Because I think you have to dare to say, this translation is no good. Why? Because I don't read easily. I think if there are a lot of translation in formal equivalence, it's because sometimes the translator is lazy. And it's a lot easier to translate word by word. This is my opinion. We need to read harder. Any more questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. It was uh, very moving and uh, thought-provoking. Uh, my question to you is, is more about your process, since you translated the book. If you can talk a little bit about the process, how, what you went through when you were translating this. I, I understand it was a collaboration at, at times, so could you talk a little bit about that? Um, it, 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 it was in collaboration? Yeah, your process, the process, how you went on to translate. Uh, the way in when you translated and yes. Well, translating this book, frankly, was very, very difficult <laughs> because um, the examples, the examples had, had never been translated, never before I did, because the examples are very, very difficult. Why? Exactly for everything I have said. So the examples in English, you can't translate literally because otherwise you lose completely the meaning, everything. And then it was a very difficult, a difficult process. I had to think a lot, to think a lot, and uh, to think in Spanish to get the idea. And then when you get the idea, you get the example, what it's about, you had to find in, your, in my own language, in this case, the, the, the equivalent example. It was thinking a lot. Uh, it's very difficult to, to, to translate in uh, dynamic equivalence, very, very difficult. It's a lot easier. Ah, what is this? Okay, casa, templo, pared, what? Why not? No, I had to get the idea and to put in my culture. This is the point, to put in my culture. And this is no, no easy at all, but this is what we have to do, all of us, to think in our culture no in the form, no in the world. How I say this? What is the, the way we used to say this? And like this, it's, it was very, very difficult to find the right example. I don't know if I have answer. I was wondering if, if, if there was any alcohol involved, actually, yes. <laughs> Felicidades. Magnífico, my husband. Okay. <laughs> Quien sea. Hagas el milagro, hágalo Dios o el diablo. Uh, ¿Qué diferencia habría en ese sentido entre creación y la recreación del traductor? 
porque yo creo que el traductor recrea, no traduce. Yo creo que el traductor, traidor o trans, eh, como queramos llamarlo, es, si es bueno, es un auténtico creador. Para traducir un poeta, ah. tiene que ser un poeta. Yo me he preguntado muchas veces, ¿quién puede traducir a García Lorca palabra oh. por palabra? No. Well, I answer in English because uh, for all the audience, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it, well, is the, the translator is recreating the message. Well, I remember one time we were in Brussels in a dinner party with my husband, and there were several, eight, ten, I don't remember, translators in, from the European Union, very, very, absolutely incredible, fantastic translators. And we were sitting down there, and my husband said the same I have said before. So translating is the most difficult task than human, the human brain can do. So the translator is, 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 has to be magic because he has to be completely faithful to the original and at the same time to recreate in his language. But being faithful, how is possible? Ah, we have to do it. We have to do it. Is what is expected from us to uh, 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 translate, being very, very faithful, but at the same time, than readers in our language consider it and this is so easy to read. Of course he has to recreate, but at the same time to be faithful. It's like these people that are one ball, another ball, the other, at the same time two things very, very difficult. So our profession is the most difficult in the world, but we are proud.